This is that Sunday that celebrates the last day of the great 50 days of Easter. Uh, Easter tide, the season, starts on Easter Sunday, and it ends today uh, with Pentecost Sunday. And so every Sunday after today until, um, well, until Advent, uh, is called after Pentecost. So um, our Easter tide uh, readings will come to a close. The uh, emphasis in the gospel today is on those promises that Jesus made about the coming of the Spirit. But the emphasis is not so much on that gospel text as it is the text in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. And we're going to go ahead and start with that and just take them in order like that uh, and then do the psalm and then Romans and then we'll finish up with John. But uh, in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> now um, Jesus had told the disciples already that they were supposed to wait in Jerusalem. Uh, this is uh, according to uh, Acts chapter 1. And he said, you will be clothed with power on high, and uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water, but y'all are going to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that is what was promised. So here we go, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, Pentecost, the literal meaning of the word is 50. See that pente? You know, a pentagram is a five, uh, five-pointed star, right? Uh, a pentagon is a five-sided uh, uh, polygon, right? Is that what they call it, a polygon? Um, and uh, Pentecost, 50 days, 50th day, already existed in Jewish culture as a harvest feast, uh, usually a first fruits of the harvest feast, and uh, it had come to become known as also a celebration of the giving of the law on uh, Mount Sinai to Moses. So this is a pre-established holiday, which is why there were well, I haven't read this yet, but there, why there's why Jerusalem is so full of people. Okay. And they're all together. Verse 2, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So um, apparently they're inside uh, this these houses, though, that they had back then weren't always all that closed off. Many times uh, they were an open courtyard portion of the house. Uh, that we Don't think of a tidy house like we have with a roof uh, 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 on top of it and all of that. Verse 3. Oh, oh uh, the thing about the violent wind. Um, this is something that... Um, is a, it's, it's a standard feature, if you will, of a theophany. It, um, we saw it with um, uh, many times in, um, uh, in the Old Testament when Moses was encountering God, when Elijah was encountering God. Uh, anytime God would make an appearance, a lot of times there would be a, a, a rush of a violent wind. Um, here, it portends the coming of the Spirit. Oh, and also this. The word uh, wind and spirit and um, ghost. Wind, spirit, go. No, yes, wind, spirit, ghost. It's all the same, okay? Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. The picture that is that Luke is trying to paint here is uh, if you can imagine a, a fire, imagine a fire, and you know how you see these tongues of uh, like, 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 that, that sweep up? He's not saying that fire actually came down, but that what they saw were tongues as of a fire, okay? Like you would see in a fire, lapping up and lapping, you know, and, and, and going down. Uh, you, can, you know what I'm talking about here. 
it's not fire, but he's trying to describe it using a metaphor of fire. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Um, this is a uh, one of the things that uh, one of the things that we like to say here is that uh, when they were speaking other languages, this isn't that practice, that prayer practice called glossolalia. Glossolalia is uh, when uh, this heightened um, uh, prayer language uh, in other tongues that the, there's somebody supposed to be an interpreter if it's done uh, in public so that everybody else can hear it or understand what it's what it means in their own language. Uh, this isn't glossolalia. This is exactly what it says. They were given the ability to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Verse 5. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven, heaven living in Jerusalem. That's what I was talking about. This is a big festival, uh, the festival of Pentecost, so consequently there's a lot of people in town. All right? And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because obviously it drew attention to the house that the disciples had gathered, right? Because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. So as they were in that room, I don't know if that means that they started getting out of the room or they just all were talking at the same time in the room and the people outside the room could hear them. Maybe they, maybe they left the room and were easier, more easily heard. I don't know. But the idea that Luke is trying to convey is that there was a wonder of communication here going on. Communication, that thing that usually divides us, that keeps us from being able to communicate with another person. And if you can't talk with them, if you can't talk with them in their own language, can you really know them? Can you really, uh, can you really appreciate them? Can you really feel at one with them? Okay? That barrier, gone. That's a part of what's going on here in this scene. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, I don't know how they knew they were Galileans. Maybe it was their accent, right? I don't know. Maybe when they spoke in these other tongues, they had some Galilean accent. Maybe it was the way they looked, or maybe they just knew that, oh, in that house over there is a bunch of Galileans. I don't know. Remember, Jesus was from Galilee. A lot of his disciples uh, that he brought to him to Jerusalem came with him from Galilee, so they were recognized as being that. Remember that scene in, um, oh, was it Peter uh, in the trial uh, of Jesus uh, who was... Uh, recognized as, you're a Galilean. I don't know if that's because of the way he looked or the way he was dressed or the way he looked, but th this is uh, something that ob obviously people could tell. Verse 8, and how is it that we, that we hear each of us in our own native language? Uh, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And what we have there in this list of uh, countries is like a, the full gamut of the, the known world at that time. Um, they, uh, when you say from Rome, um, that's as far as they knew that anything existed. And um, yeah, so the known world, basically, is what the emphasis is on here. A miracle of communication. This is a, um, a, a foregleam, if you will, of where Acts is going because they are commissioned to uh, witness to uh, the gospel in starting in Jerusalem and extending to Samaria, just, which is just in the north, and Judea, and then to the other out, outermost parts of the earth. Well, this is a foregleam of all of that. Verse 
12. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine, which is to say that, you know, they're drunk. And it's not uncommon. That's not a judgment, okay? Uh, that's what you do at festivals. You imbibe. And so this is like, oh, a natural thing. Oh, they're just, they're just partying early. That's all. But Peter, verse 14, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Peter does a lot of the uh, representative speaking in the book of Acts. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Hence the, oh, they're drunk. A little early for that, but okay. Maybe it's just left over from last night. I don't know. Verse 16. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. One of the things that Luke is very keen on, uh, and, and Matthew as well, um, is, is tying in uh, the Old Testament scriptures. Um, uh, Luke is much uh, more concerned about that than any other writer, I think. Uh, he will pull these uh, quotes from the prophets, and you won't think that uh, when, you, when you read it in the context of the prophets, it's like, really? Uh, they're quoting that? Well, here indeed is something like that, that fits. Verse 17. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now that thing about sons and daughters, that's, that's pretty keen if you think about it. Um, you didn't have a whole lot of participation by women uh, speaking in public, let alone uh, being prophets. Um, not a lot of it, okay? Not a lot to be had. But yet, that was one of the things that uh, the prophet Joel mentioned. And look, quite, to be quite frank, we're not sure exactly when Joel was written or what situation Joel was writing about. Um, so it's kind of got this mystical quality of it can be applied anywhere. Um, and so here is Luke using this uh, in the mouth of Peter to apply to this situation. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Um, uh, this is a... a Notice the emphasis here. We've had this male-female thing uh, where we had sons and daughters uh, and when we had um, uh, uh, both men and women on the slaves, uh, young men, old men. The idea is to uh, uh, give us uh, bookends of a, of a continuum of like, like, as in, wow, this could happen to anybody, that kind of thing. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. These are typical um, standard things that show up when God's voice is there. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Um, again, these are standard things uh, that happen when there is a theophany. Then, verse 21, last verse, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the kickoff event. This is the Pentecost event. This is the thing that, if it wasn't for this scene right here, uh, we wouldn't have a Pentecost Sunday in church. Think about it. Uh, there's only one uh, gospel writer that wrote a sequel. There's only one uh, book of Acts, okay? There's not the book of Acts according to Matthew. There's no book of Acts according to John. This, there's only one book of Acts, and that's this one. And because of the fact that we have that narration, we have this celebration. Um, interesting, huh? Hang on to all of that. We're going to move on to the psalm. The psalm is, uh, comes from Psalm 104, 
uh, verses 25 to 35 and verse 37. Now, um, the versification comes from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and if you don't read it in the Book of Common Prayer and you read it in your Bible, it's not going to uh, match up quite right. Uh, this is typical. Um, the Psalms uh, suffered a lot of rework uh, because of the fact that um, uh, when, you, when you look at the Psalms, you know, sometimes they have this little heading. Uh, not, I'm not talking about the headings like we have in the Book of Common Prayer. I'm talking about the headings that you find in, uh, in your Bible. Uh, where it'll, it'll say uh, like a Psalm of David or something. Those things used to be versified and then uh, uh, it was decided somewhere along the line, okay, we're not gonna versify those anymore. And so that like changed the versification. And so it's always been a little bit fluid, if you will. But uh, if you look in Psalm 104, it is a Psalm which is uh, 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 proclaiming wonder uh, to God about creation. Verse 25, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number, creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is the Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. Uh, that's an interesting uh, thing, a reference to the Leviathan. Well, Leviathan is like a, a, a mythical sea creature, uh, the sea monsters. Uh, we see evidence of that a lot. Remember, um, Israel didn't have a possession of the coast a lot back then, so they weren't really uh, keen on uh, water animals. And so uh, in their economy, you would see um, a sea monsters and such. So the Leviathan is seen as like, uh, even the sea monsters, like, God is such a great God that he just made the sea monster just, just for the fun of it, okay? That's, what the, that's the kind of uh, praise that's being given to God here. Verse 28, all of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it, you open your hand, and they are filled with good things. This kind of goes along with our Pentecost theme here in the realm of, remember what was Pentecost event originally? Remember what I said? A harvest festival, yes, first fruits. So this is uh, one of the reasons why this portion of the Psalm is uh, being uh, uh, used. Verse 30, you hide your face and they are terrified. You take away their breath and they die and return to their dust. This is a way of saying how the presence of God is what gives growth. And when God is not present, there is just the opposite of growth. There's death. Verse 31, you send forth your spirit. Ah, here's another thing where it ties in with the Pentecost theme. You send forth your spirit and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. So you see this psalm is uh, tying in uh, the, the giving of God's spirit uh, to, uh, in, in, the, in the sense of, uh, remember in, in Genesis 1, uh, where the, uh, the, the wind of God, the spirit of God, the breath of God um, uh, uh, hovered over and, uh, and uh, turned uh, the, um, uh, animated the, uh, that's what created something out of chaos, right? Here, we see this allusion to creation with the sending forth of your spirit. It's also wind, it's also breath, like in creation. And they are created, as it says in verse 31. And so you renew the face of the earth. So this is the idea of renewal. Remember, the Pentecost celebration that was happening here in Acts is viewed as a, a re-upping of God, uh, a, a gifting creation with his presence, with his spirit, and it starts with these people in his church. Verse 32, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. This is very poetic language. To, uh, to declare the bigness of God, right? The greatness of God. Verse 34, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. So in the psalmist's economy, he is seeing all of this wonder and appreciating all of the wonder of the creation, the giving of the Spirit, 
and saying, the only way I can properly respond to it is with praise to God. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. And then it skips over verse 36 to bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Uh, there's a lot of emendation that goes on in the Psalms, especially as we have them in our uh, Sunday readings in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, the verse 36, uh, verse, it's not verse 36 in, in the Bibles, it's something else, but it's, a, it's something about um, uh, cursing enemies. <laughs> and uh, that stuff gets edited out uh, uh, by our uh, Book of Common Prayer uh, version. Uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, hallelujah. So this is a very appropriate psalm for Pentecost because it celebrates it as a day of, of, uh, uh, of recognizing the glory of God in all of creation. All right, moving on. Romans 8, verses 22 to 27. Romans 8, verses 22 to 27. Paul is writing, and he's in the middle of, a, of an argument. We don't have enough time to go into all of it, but just the portion that we have for our reading today for Pentecost Sunday. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. What he's talking about here is the repercussions of the resurrection of Christ, okay? In Paul's economy, what has happened is the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains. Like, it's like, it's, like it's, it's been birthing something ever since uh, that happened. Because what we saw in the resurrection is the future for ourselves, okay? And when we see that future for ourselves, we see that, oh, we, it's, it's the already and not yet. It's like, okay, it happened to Jesus. It is happening to us. It will happen to us. But it started something. It started a birthing in creation. You see that? We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Okay, the first fruits of the Spirit. Um, remember uh, the harvest uh, festival, which uh, Pentecost uh, was originally. So this is kind of a tie into that. We ourselves, we also groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. So we're also groaning in this sense of, of, of giving birth to something. Uh, and what Paul, go, where he goes here is the thing about adoption, okay? The idea is that um, he said this back in um, uh, verse 15 of that same chapter where he said, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you, were, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Okay, the idea is that we are adopted into God's family, and yes, he says we'll, we, that we wait, but it's one of those already and not yet. It's like we've got a taste of it, we've got a foregleam of it, we've got the beginning of it, but we don't have the fulfillment of it yet. So that's why he says, while well, we wait for the adoption, and he goes on, the redemption of our bodies, okay? Redemption, another way of, uh, another word for redemption is basically saving, okay? Basically, um, the saving of our bodies. Um, remember, the, the promise in the resurrection is of a bodily resurrection, which isn't to say that we're going to look the same. There's something different about it. Remember, uh, the disciples had difficulty seeing and figuring out that Jesus was Jesus, right? Uh, why? Because Jesus' resurrected body didn't look exactly like uh, his, uh, his, his earthly body. So that's the reason why they didn't really notice him. Uh, remember how Mary Magdalene uh, mistook him for the gardener. And um, uh, the men on the road to Emmaus uh, didn't recognize him until what? Oh, the breaking of the bread. And uh, the disciples didn't want to believe it was him until he showed them his hands. And it's like, if he really looked that familiar, if he looked exactly like he did uh, in, during his earthly ministry, they wouldn't have had any problem, would they? No. Well, okay, there you go. The redemption of our bodies. So that's where I, that's where I, that was my takeoff point on that. Verse 24, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? Good point, right? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. 
So again, this is Paul's getting at the fact that in the resurrection, something has been started, the ball has been rolling, and it's going in a certain direction, and it's not going to stop. I just realized this might be a little bit too low. I'm gonna raise it up a bit. And so um, that's what he's talking about. So we're waiting for this to be fulfilled uh, 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 with patience. Verses 26 and 27, then I gotta move on to the gospel. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, so Paul is doing an application of what the Pentecost event means for us, okay, as Christians living today. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. How? For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. There's this idea here that Paul is conveying that there's an intercession of the Spirit that takes place on our behalf that can't even be expressed in words. It's just, uh, again, with the, he uses the word size here, but remember earlier he mentioned the thing about groaning and labor pains, that kind of thing. It's that kind of thing. Is that uh, That's the reason why sometimes the best prayer <laughs> are the ones that there's no words. It's just, Ah, you know, whatever, whatever that voice, that sound is that comes out. Well, the Spirit intercedes for us, Paul is saying. And the last verse, And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Saints is just a common word he uses for all believers in, in this day and age. Uh, don't think of saints in the, in the way of, um, you know, saint Christopher or St. John or St. Paul or St. <laughs> Everybody's a saint, right? In the, in the idea of the, the, the Latter-day Saints called their church the Latter-day Saints. The saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit is acting for us actively. And this is something that is to our benefit as Christians walking on this earth. That's all I have time to say about uh, Romans 8. We're moving on to the gospel, the final thing. And the gospel is uh, comes from John, and it's going to be in John chapter 15. Now, uh, you might ask yourself the question, well, why are we getting a reading from John if, uh, if we've already, if the thing is about Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit? Well, Jesus talked about the coming of the Spirit in his teachings in John. In fact, he talked about, he, he had a specific word for it. In Greek, it's parakletos, um, some people anglicize it and say the paraclete. So if you hear people talking about the paraclete, that's what it is. Uh, it usually gets translated as advocate or counselor. Um, uh, in, our, in our translation, it's going to be advocate. But it's a reference to the Spirit, okay? And in John's Gospel, John's economy, as a, a word I like to use, the way it works is that the Spirit can't come until he goes. There's no such thing as him being there and the Spirit. He's got to go so the Spirit can come, okay? Um, look at this in verse uh, 26 and 27 of John 15, verses 26 and 27. When the advocate comes, now that word advocate, that's the one, it can also be translated helper, okay? When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. Oh, by the way, uh, you know how we say uh, in the Nicene Creed, um, the, believe in the Holy Spirit uh, sent by the Father and the Son? Well, that's, this is basically where that comes from. Um, Jesus is saying that, yes, it's being sent to you from the Father, but uh, uh, in, indirectly it's coming from him as well, okay? Um, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. So this thing, this advocate, um, it, it, it's as though he's saying, after I go, this helper that you, will, uh, that you are being sent will even give you more proof that, uh, well, the, of what I said was, uh, was accurate, was true, was on, on, on target. Um, we're going to move on to uh, verse, uh, chapter 16, uh, verses 4b to 15. Um, if you look at this, uh, why we started in, at 4b? Because that's the beginning of a paragraph. 
Um, remember, Jesus taught about the coming of the Holy Spirit quite a few times, um, about five. In, this, in these readings, we have like the last three of them uh, during his, uh, last, during his um, uh, last big teaching section in John. Uh, verse 4b of chapter 16. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me where are you going. He's not saying you should be asking, although somebody does ask that uh, somewhere else in John. I think it's uh, Philip or Tom. There's somebody that says, where are you going, uh, Lord? Um, no, he's saying, like, nobody's saying, of course you're not asking me that now. When Jesus says, I'm going to him who sent me, this is that reference to what we experienced in, uh, in the ascension, right? The, and the, uh, the, in John, the crucifixion, the raising up on the cross, and the crucifixion was the beginning of the, uh, the ascension. So that's the, the beginning part of the raising up, okay? The crucifixion and the ascension are, are, are a continuous event in the Gospel of John. That's the reason why we don't have a separate ascension in the Gospel of John. The cross event basically set that whole ball rolling. Verse 5, but now I'm going to him, oh no, verse 6. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Because if you think about the early church, there were a lot of people that felt sad that, oh, I mean, can you imagine um, having come to belief and to follow this new, uh, this new thing that's out, but yet, oh, I never got to meet him. Oh, you, you, you met him? You know, oh, how I wish I had met him. So this is, uh, this is kind of a, he's saying this in, during his ministry to speak to those people later on even so that they, they know that, yeah, there's a sorrow there because uh, they didn't get to see him, meet him, yada, yada. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate or helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So this is where we get that thing that, He's already sent that the advocate is going to be sent from the Father. And now he's saying that he's sending it. So that's the reason why we say from the Father and the Son in our creed. Verse 8. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit convoluted. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Oof, way too, there's a lot there. I don't have time to go into all that. I gotta move on though. But the bottom line of what Jesus is saying is that um, when the Spirit comes, there will be a clarity that didn't exist prior. Uh, there's going to be an aha moment, if you will. Uh, with regard to when we look back at the teachings of Jesus. Uh, verses 12 uh, to 15 now. We're going to stop at verse 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He's saying basically that the Spirit is going to give us stuff that he didn't give us and that we don't see in the Gospels, right? When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he wants, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. We see the coming of the Spirit on Pentecost Sunday as the birthday of the church, yes? Well, this is another way of uh, saying that um, in the church is where the, sp the, the Spirit abides. This is and, and Paul will use the metaphor of the body of Christ. And this is uh, uh, why the church isn't just a uh, society for preserving the old things. That's not what we do. There's many things, many things I'm saying to you, you cannot bear them now. 
But then when the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He's not going to speak on His own. He's going to, he's going to tell you of things that are to come. Verse 14, He will glorify me, which is to say, you know, reflect me, uh, uh, not contradict, as in totally like be in line with, as in like this will be totally continuous. Yes, continuous, total continuity, okay? He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Basically, he's saying his words, his message, his, uh, his proclamation, his uh, good news. Verse 15, all that the Father has is mine. This is just another way of saying I and the Father are one, which he said in other places. For this reason, I said, that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we have in this last statement, Jesus is wrapping up saying, what I say is what the Father says, what the Spirit says, it's all one thing. This isn't a, uh, uh, a mom and dad relationship uh, thing where, where um, uh, the son uh, or the daughter goes to one parent and they don't get the answer they want so they go to somebody else. That's not what the Trinity is like. But this is a foretaste of what uh, the, tr the, the, the church will finalize as a trinity, we, which we're going to celebrate uh, next Sunday. That's